Hello, it's Scott Manley, and everybody is talking about this interstellar visitor. Now, I talked about it a few weeks ago. We weren't 100% sure, although I was pretty sure back then. But it has been confirmed now that we've got much more data that it has a, a hyperbolic eccentricity. It's uh, traveling with a, an excess velocity of 26 kilometers per second at infinity. Uh, the eccentricity is about 1.19 and it did come very close to the sun and very close to the earth. It wasn't discovered until it started coming close to the earth, largely because that's where most telescopes looked. It, it essentially came out of the sun relative to us. When it was far away from the sun on the far side, we couldn't see it because it was too far away and too faint. And it is still very small and faint. But with all the telescopes that have been focused on it, we now have a bit more ideas about the physical characteristics of it. Now, it is too small to be any more than a single pixel on any imaging system, but that single pixel can tell us a lot of information about the object. First of all, we can take that uh, single pixel and do a uh, spectroscopy on it. That is, you split out into the different colors and try to figure out if there's anything interesting in it, any ionization or uh, absorption lines. And uh, one of the first ones actually came from uh, somebody I know, Alan Fitzsimmons. He, uh, they uh, took this and they found a relatively reddish spectrum. Now, when I say reddish, what they mean, what I really mean, it's kind of grayish red. So the spectrum is kind of flat. If it was red, it would be like red over here and then no blue at all. So it's not like red paint. It's just like a kind of gray, reddish color. Um, it looks. It looked initially like it might be close to those of Kuiper Belt objects, but it's now looking more like an inner belt, inner uh, solar system asteroid. So it's looking less and less interesting. Other people have gone out and got spectra, incidentally. The other thing you can do to measure physical characteristics is you can measure the brightness changes over time. Now, obviously, it is getting fainter and fainter and fainter as it heads out of the solar system and never coming back. Um, so it'll be apparently invisible to Hubble by about the end of the year. So some data is still being collected, but it's getting harder and harder. But beyond that long-term brightness change, there are short-term changes. Uh, what happens is the brightness goes up and then it drops to a, a you know, lower value and then it goes up. And it does this with about a just over seven hour period. Now using the difference in brightness between the top and the bottom and the shape, the approximate shape of the curve, you can try to guess what kind of shape of object would have created this. And the the numbers that we get suggest that it is a long object about uh, with an aspect ratio or an axis ratio of about six to one. That means the long axis is about six times longer than the short axis and it's rotating lengthwise. So when people saw the long cigar shaped uh, artist impressions, many people were like, oh my God, it really is Rama from Rendezvous with Rama. But I'm gonna point out in Rendezvous with Rama, the uh, object is spinning all around its long axis uh, rather than spinning around its short axis. Um, so anyway, six to one is what seems to have come out in the middle. I've seen as high as 10 to one as low as three to one. We have one other constraint we don't have is the exact orientation of the rotation with respect to Earth. If it is rotating exactly end on, then uh, it could be, uh, <laughs> it could be, it could have different values. That's what I'm saying. So we're not gonna get that information. And the only way we are gonna get that information is getting up close to get a picture. And believe it or not, there are people that have been thinking about this. I mean, beyond me speculating on Twitter that we could do a solar fryby to get up to the kind of velocities needed. Also of note is the object got a name. Now, normally an object would not get a name so quickly because you would want to get enough astrometry to know that you had actually identified and knew its position for years to come so it could never be confused with another one. But this is a special case. We're never gonna get that long-term astrometry. So the discovery team at PanStars in Hawaii came up with a name and it's Oumuamua, and I've actually mispronounced that. I'm, there's a lot of articles writing about this. It's spelled uh, Okina, which is like an apostrophe, O-U-M-U-A-M-U-A. And these have this is a few things from Hawaiian language I've learned. That, this, this first apostrophe shaped thing is an okina, which is basically a glottal stop where you stop the air flowing out. And I 
don't we don't have those in English, so I have a hard time saying them. Or not saying them. Yeah. Anyway, um <laughs> the name and then repeating mua mua means like it doubles the strength or accentuates it. But apparently it's a loosely translated as scout, the first scout coming from interstellar space, which is pretty cool name. I like it. Even though I have such trouble saying it. Um so anyway, could we ever send a spacecraft to it? Well, I mean, we know what direction it's going. We know how fast it's going, roughly. The problem is it is going insanely fast. So to launch a spacecraft to it directly from Earth, if we waited for the correct launch window, we would need something like 30 kilometers per second of delta V just from the ground. And, you know, um, what is it? Uh, New Horizons is the fastest spacecraft we've ever launched, and it left Earth with 14. We have a lot more to go before we get up to that kind of velocity, and chemical engines really are not going to be up to the task. You know, the rocket equation just doesn't like getting high multiples of your exhaust velocity. The tyranny of the rocket equation says, no, you cannot do this by brute force alone. There is a possibility that uses chemical propulsion and a couple of interesting gravity assists. So I mentioned earlier, I speculated on Twitter, hey, we could do a fryby. What is a fryby? Well, you may know about the Oberth effect, which I've mentioned several times whenever I play Kerbal Space Program. If you drop down close to an object in a parabolic trajectory and then fire your engines, the amount of velocity you get from those engines is vastly multiplied by your current velocity relative to the target. So if you were to drop down close to the sun, say to like three or four solar radii, you would only need about one kilometer per second of delta V at that point to actually catch up with uh, this interstellar interloper. Now the problem of course is then that you're gonna melt your spacecraft. Hence, instead of being a flyby, it is a fryby. The other part of the, the other problem here is that to get down there, you don't want to just use brute force and leave from the Earth and drop down to the Sun. What you want to do is send your spacecraft out to Jupiter, have it kick the thing into the correct inclination orbit and drop its periaps down to the correct, uh, very close to the Sun, and then with all the shielding to keep it keep it cool, stop it frying, make that burn, and then it would be headed off towards the object. But, assuming all this works, you still have the problem that the astrometry is going to be good, the position is going to be relatively good, but by the time we get there, the errors are going to have built up. So even if you could send something out that way, you might, you might just fly by and not know that you'd seen it because it was so faint, so small. It would still take decades to get out there. You know, it would take maybe a decade to wait for Jupiter and everything to get into the right location. And then it would take years to perform the actual assist. And by that time, of course, the thing is just continuing outwards, disappearing off into the great black. It'll be in the solar system for centuries. But uh, I think you want to have something that can get there and potentially maneuver. Now, there are a few other people offering suggest a few other ideas that don't require chemical propulsion. Obviously, ion propulsion's out because you really need uh, a lot of power for that. So you could do... do nuclear ion where you have a nuclear reactor on board. It's not sh not really sure those numbers add up. Um, the breakthrough star shot proposal, which you might have heard about, is a way of accelerating tiny little spacecraft up to you know, interstellar velocities using lasers. If somebody ever builds that, that would be great because then you could just keep sending spacecraft out that way until one of them gets close enough to find the object. Of course, you then have to figure out what kind of science you could do with an object that size, but I would leave that to the scientists designing the space probe. So look, it's really, really exciting, but yeah, don't believe some of the crazy conspiracy theories, right? The artist's impressions are entirely based upon this light curve. The, the colors are actually a little more normal than we'd expect. It, if it is spinning, well, it's spinning around its long axis. It's not a spacecraft, come on, seriously. It did actually, there is some evidence that it might have passed close to one known star uh, about 1.3 million years ago, but the errors on that are still huge and it's more likely to have just skimmed through the Oort cloud rather than 
come from the inner solar system of that object. Beyond that, uh, there's nothing, no candidate sources. So um, we can't say that it has come from another another location anytime quickly. Uh, so yeah, um, fascinating object. Maybe we'll find out more, maybe not. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.